Amen. Delighted to be with you tonight. I'm glad I don't dress like that. Amen. I believe in conservatism. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, it's a joy to be back tonight. God has been so good. Do I hear amen on that? You know, some of you acted awful last night. <laughs> amen. Wasn't it wonderful? Oh, my, my. You know, it's amazing how sometimes we satisfy ourselves with viennies and crackers when God's got a steak for us. Just a great big steak with heavenly Worcestershire sauce on it, amen. Oh, that's so marvelous, so good. And uh, folks didn't seem like want to leave last night. God just met with us in the power of God. Souls can save me drunk as a ham. <laughs> amen. Spiritually, that is. Amen. Let me uh, say just a word now. I appreciate so much your prayers. Uh, for my mother, she was moved out of intensive care today. Step by step, we're just believing God and uh, trusting him for the ultimate results. God's still on the throne. He's still able. The Bible said there's a God in heaven. Aren't you glad of that? Call upon me, he said, and I will answer thee. I'll show thee what? Great and mighty things. So we rejoice in that. But today my brother, my baby brother, was admitted to the same hospital in uh, somewhat of a bad condition. And we want you to pray for him. Pray that the Lord will touch him. And pray for us that the Lord will give us strength. The doctors give instructions that uh, only the very immediate family, we must stay with mother around the clock, someone must be with her. And you pray for us, uh, just the Lord worked it out. Next week we do have the week off, because the Lord just seemed like worked it out so we can help out and be there and see about her needs. And you do pray for it. By the way, she said to thank you for praying, and we bring that to you. And she said, I've been praying for you too. <laughs> I said, I know it. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous? Then let me thank you for your offering. We're grateful for it. We appreciate it so much, so very much. May the Lord bless you. And I want to apologize. My my wife and I were talking today, and I've been so busy. I've, I've just been coming here at night, been coming back from the hospital, getting in home about a quarter after five and getting ready. And I'm honest. I'm not to... Uh, listen, I, I don't I don't want to get in a rut or anything. I just want to be honest with God about it. I was speaking for myself. I haven't had a chance to get a haircut, and I'm sorry about it. I'm honest. I apologize. You say, well, it don't bother me. It bothers me. It bothers me, and I, I want to, listen, I, I, I want you to know, here and now, brother, I, I, I want to be that man that God can touch and anoint. I, I don't want the Holy Ghost to ever be displeased with me, amen? And I believe, uh, somebody said, well, preacher, a lot of preachers just got off the rut and preach about these things. I believe a Christian ought to look like a Christian, don't you? I'm not, I, you say, well, preacher blue, they call, this, call preacher something like clothesline preacher, or preachers, they can't preach about nothing but haircuts and clothes and things like that. Folks, I believe if God deals with your heart and God speaks to you out of this book, you don't have to figure it out. You can go ahead and do it. Amen. You can just go ahead and do it. I've heard folks say they've prayed about tithing. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. You don't have to pray about tithing. You can go ahead and start. It'll be all right with God. <laughs> Amen. You can just go ahead and start. And uh, I heard a young man the other day say, I'm praying about getting a haircut. I said, son, you don't have to pray about it. <laughs> oh, he he looked like Mabel or Francis or somebody. Amen. And uh, I said, you don't have to pray about it. I want to, huh? Yeah, that's right. I saw some of you men. Listen, I love you dearly. You need a haircut like me. I'd almost let you cut mine if you let me cut yours. <laughs> Fact is, or some of you are so bad off, I would. <laughs> Amen. And I promise you right now, you'd do a good job on me because you'd be afraid of what I do to you. Amen. And I might as well own up to it. Before you left here, you'd look like a mohawk. Amen. But honest, some of you men need a haircut. I need one. I'm not to... I, I'm not uh, saying that just to try to be funny. You really do. I'm a little surprised at some of you getting fuzzy around the edges. Amen? Kind of looking like Pat Boone or somebody. You're going to start calling him Patricia, you know that? <laughs> Amen. 
Hey, man. Hey, well, hey, man. You said I'm mad at you. Well, I done got your money now, and you ain't gonna get it back. <laughs> hey, man. So, glory. Glory to God. Isn't the Lord so good? Open your Bibles to the book of Job tonight. The book of Job. Let's stand together and read from chapter 38. I want to read one verse again tonight. Just one verse. Job puts forth in this verse, I'll tell you the verse in a minute. The first time I read it, I... I read it and reread it and read it again, and I I could not uh, see what Job was saying. I knew what the words were. I could fathom that real easy. But it was for some time before it broke on my heart what Job was bringing out to us, Brother Frank, and how that he was dealing with something so, uh, well, so great. I want to read verse 17. It may not appear to you instantly, and it may not at all, but I want to read verse 17, and you read with us, and then we'll bow our heads for prayer, and then bring the message. Have the gates of death been opened unto thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadows of death? Now, we're going to read it again. I'd like for you to underline it, and maybe you'd like to reflect back on it and read it again and study some, maybe the entirety of the chapter. Have the gates of death been opened unto thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? Our blessed Father in heaven, we're so grateful, God, for the presence of the Holy Spirit that we feel right now. Oh, God, he is so precious. Lord, we thank you that not one single service has gone by, that he, that third person of the Trinity, has not been present in our midst, and we're so grateful. But now, Lord, it's another service and another night. And God, we realize more tonight that we can't live on the past. We need a blessing from heaven tonight. God, I don't know of a thing that would bless my heart more than to see some old sinner walk the aisle and get saved. Oh, Lord, how I like that word, saved. God, such a precious word, pulled out of the very pit almost, reached down and got from the mire and the clay, lift our feet up out of a horrible pit. God, there's nothing more blessed to see the light of God break on the face of a man or woman that's just been saved and born into the family of God. So, Lord, we wait before you and wait upon you. And so, God, I pray tonight you'll bless and save and draw the backslidden home. And God, touch me. I need another touch tonight. I need that touch of heaven. Oh, God, I need that touch of heaven. And so, God, tonight, bless us and breathe upon us. And I pray tonight, Lord, that we'll all pray about the services tomorrow. God, seven souls, men and their wives. God, and then there'll be others we trust besides them. God, we're just waiting for a great ingathering tomorrow. So, Lord, tonight, just let us see somebody saved tonight. God, give me that liberty. I seem like I just can't quit talking to you. God, I want that liberty tonight. God, touch my throat and give me clarity of speech. And, and Lord, just give me that heavenly energy that comes from the vitamins of God. Have your way among us and bless us. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Job's dealing with a gate is one that it took me some time to see. He sets the gate out as an example, as a very prominent example, and begins to deal 
with a simple thing such as a gate. Now, I wouldn't have to ask this, but just so you'll have the chance to identify yourself, I wouldn't have to ask how many country folks and ex-farmers are here. It still shows on you. How many have we got, though? Let me see you raise your hand. Amen? Yeah, I thought you was. I, I really had you spotted all the time. Some of the others are, but they're trying to forget it, yeah. But notice, if you will, I'm sure that all of us are, well, we surely know what a gate is. There's, there's nothing mysterious about that instrument. It's a closure that, uh, uh, well, to a yard or, in my thinking, I remember the old barn lot and that old big gate that swings so prominently to allow the entrance or to allow the exit of those that uh, use that instrument, the gate. And Job said here, have the gates of death opened, uh, the gates of death been opened unto thee. Now I'll tell you, I begin to think about that, and I begin to study on what Job was really talking about and using the instrument called the gate. And I begin to see some things, and God began to share on my heart and my mind some things that I want to share with you tonight. Did you know the gate is, a, well, as I've already said, an instrument to allow the exit or the entrance into a certain locality. But notice, if you will, there's one prominent impossibility. It's absolutely impossible for you to be on both sides of the gate at one time. You just cannot. There's no way. So many times we refer to fence travelers, but I'm not talking about that tonight. I'm talking about somebody that cannot be on both sides of that gate at one time. And notice, if you will, he's having a reference to death. He said the gates of death. Oh, dear friend, there's some of you sitting here right now. Oh, God's been so good to you and has blessed you beyond measure. And looked down upon you and smiled upon you and has been so good to you. But my friend, I must break this news to you. One day after a while, you're going to come up to this gate. There's no way of getting around it. Uh, Brother Danny said a while ago, the rapture may come tonight. Uh, and we'll either go out by the rapture or we'll meet death somewhere, Brother Frank. Uh, are your course of action. You're just going to keep on living and you're going to keep on being young. It's just not so. You're on your way toward death. The Bible said in Hebrews 9 and verse 27, he said it's appointed unto man wants to die. Brother, like it or not, think about it or not, run from it or not, that's on every one of our trails and one day it's going to change. You say, man, no getting around it. No getting around it. But notice now some things about this gate in particular. And see some things I want you to see. Now, first of all, we hear folks say, Brother Blue, I'm in still in the land of the living. Well, that's not exactly so. We're in the land of the dying. Amen. There's no living going on around here. Ever last one of us are dying. Mother, that baby you're holding in your arms right now, the very day that doctor spanked breath into his lungs, it didn't begin to live. It began to die. Amen. Well, you see an old person wobbling down the street on her uncertain legs. And you said, Preacher Blue, oh, Brother Blue, they're about to die. But if they've been saved by the grace of God, they're about to live. Amen. Oh, isn't there a vast difference? But notice, if you will now, we're talking about a gate. First of all, when you go through that gate, you leave the land where clocks are at. You leave the land where suns rises and sets at. You leave the land of shadows and valleys. That is, if you're right with God, and you leave the lands of Octobers and Novembers and Decembers, and you step over in a land where the sun, oh, I'm getting drunk again, amen, where the sun never goes down. No more pages will be pulled off of the calendar, glory to God. When you step over through that gate, you're in eternity then, amen. 
Isn't that great? Down here we said, well, there goes September. There goes October. But when you get through that gate, if you're right with God, throw all the clocks and the calendars away and said just one eternal day. Amen. And that's stepping through the gate. All right. Just step through the gate of death upon eternity. And notice, if you will, that gate closes on this whole world that we know here. That world it closes on hospitals and screaming trips in the ambulance heading for the emergency room. It closes on the unsafe certainties of this life and opens up on the positive of the other side. Glory to God. Somebody's praying for me. I feel the power coming through. Amen. Somebody's getting a hold of God. But notice, if you will, there's some more things I want to share with you about this gate. There's some of you come driving up tonight. Your life don't measure up to the will of God. And you said, oh, preacher blue, I got here tonight because I'm such a good driver. I, I just drove up. I'm an excellent uh, a driver. My dexterity. I, I can perform under the wheel. Uh, but I want to tell you, friend of mine, uh, it wasn't your ability and skill at the driving wheel. Uh, it was the mercy of God that got you here. Uh, it was the goodness of God uh, that drove you up in the yard. Uh, and nothing belongs to you. Amen. I hear so many folks referring to luck. I got one thing to say to you. You make me sick. Amen. If you believe in luck, I'd be ashamed of it. Most stupid thing I've ever saw is a grown person down on their knees in the pastor crawling around looking for a four-leaf clover. <laughs> That's about the height of stupidity. Amen. There's only one thing I can think dumber than that. That's somebody nailing the old horseshoe that's been wore by an old mare up on over the door. Amen. I hope it falls on your head and knocks a knot on it. Amen. I told you about the fellow who held a rabbit's foot out in Dallas, Texas and said, you know what that means, don't you? I said, yeah, it means there's a rabbit somewhere with three feet. Amen. That's all it means, stupid. Amen. That's all it means. Some of you said, well, how in the name of God did I get here? You got here because God let you get here. Amen. That's it right there. You got right here because God lets you get here. There's some of you like to rear back and say, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. I tell you right now, I watched all the lights and the stop sign. Did you ever stop and think tonight, every old drunk that lays down on a drunkard's bed tonight, he'll not get up in the morning huh, because he's healthy and got muscular arms. It's because the grace of God watched over him huh, and brought him back to consciousness. Amen. He's not saved. Let me tell you something, sinner. And you put this down where you You'll remember it. You're not here tonight because you're in good health and because you've not had a car wreck. God's watched over your stinking life and brought you right here tonight so you can hear the word of God. Amen. Let me tell you something, backslider. You're not here because you're living good and because you deserve this goodness. But I tell you right now, I like that psalm, don't you? He said, surely... Goodness and mercy shall follow me. Now you said that goes to a Christian. Let me give you something to think about. Let me give you something. I grant you God's, David's talking about his other good shepherd. I grant you that. I know that. But let me let, me let you reflect back on something. How many is sitting here right now that maybe one time was old ex-drunks? That you got so drunk you'd rather, you got home and don't even know how you got there. You drove your car up in the yard and didn't even remember driving. Oh, you said I was just fortunate. I was lucky. No, you can like it or lump it, believe it or disbelieve it. It was the mercy of God that got you from there to your house. Amen. You went across that railroad track. And you didn't even know when that train whizzed by you could have crushed you. But God just pushed you out of the way. Amen. God spared you and let you live. How many times going down the road? Uh, here comes somebody aiming right at you at a high rate of speed. And oh, he had jerked the wheel and said, wasn't I lucky? Why, God bless your poor simple soul. It was just the hand of God scooted you out of the way. Amen. And what your fast thinking or your dexterity that brought you out of the way. It was God Almighty. I'm glad of that. It kills some of you to give it the credit, though, don't it? Amen. 
God gets the credit. I'm going to give it to him. Amen. That kills. I was talking. I was talking to an old boy one day. Never will forget this. I was coming up the road and there's a traffic jam on the highway and I didn't know what it was and I picked up the microphone of a little old citizen's band radio and hollered out ahead. I said, somebody tell me what's wrong. And the fella come back and he's one of these stunt drivers and jumps uh, 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 well over things in a car, you know. And I said, what's wrong up there? And he said, there's a wreck. Why, he said, uh, some fool up there's run into another. Why, he said, I, I'm a daredevil. Boy, that opened the door for me, amen. You said you ain't supposed to preach on them CB radios. Silly boy. You mean you put a microphone in front of my mouth and expect me to whistle Yankee Doodle? <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> and I said, feller, I want to tell you something right now. Your luck ain't got nothing to do with it. He said, I beg your pardon. And all of a sudden, that channel, you know, just got as quiet as death. Amen. Just like God shut everybody's mouth. And I said, you're going to take your last jump one day, and if you're not right with God, you'll wind up in hell. Boy, he said, I, I've been thinking about that here lately. Every preacher needs a CB radio. Amen. Amen. And I said, are you ready for that pick of that trip one day? He said, no, I ain't. Now, I didn't know where he's at. He may have been five miles. I didn't know where he's at. And I said, has anybody ever told you how to get right with God? He said, no. And I said, I'll tell you one thing. If you got something to write on, I'll give you something to read that you can find out how to be saved. Amen. And I started telling him of Galatians chapter 3, verse 22. He said, I'll write her down. I said, I just got it down. I told him John chapter 3, verse 7. I told him Acts 16, 30, 31, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I told him God's plan for fallen man. And I said, Romans 10, 9. He said, can you tell me what it said? And I quoted it to him. And all of a sudden, somewhere, some other old boy said, hey, you're getting too fast. I was trying to take that down too. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Yeah, I second the motion, amen. Oh, friend of mine, you hear me? You said, will you ever meet that old boy in heaven? I don't know, but I give him enough of God's word to tell him how to get there. Hallelujah. All of a sudden, some old sore head chimed in and said, if we're going to preach, get on another channel, amen. I said, ain't he going to do it? I'm going to preach to you too. What I'm saying is, friend of mine, you better quit depending on luck and realize every good and perfect gift comes down from God. It's not you, but God that gives it to you. How many of you realize that? Hey Amen. You better realize that. So that gate, that gate, bless your heart, opens in eternity. But now notice, if you will, I want you to see this. God sends goodness and mercy all the days of your life. That little infant baby that could have well, a disease could hit you. You could have died when you was a baby. But God's brought you through that childhood. Brought you through all those little old narrow escapes. Did you ever hear anybody say when they grow up, I don't see how I ever live to get grown? I'm one of them. It's one dry and fell off one of them grapevines that were swinging on and got killed. Amen. It's one dry and got trampled down there in the barnyard by some old wild a horse. Amen. Oh, you said, Preacher Blue, I was just lucky. No such a thing, friend of mine. Goodness and mercy. The blessings of God has brought you safe thus far. Amen. I'm going to tell you right now your destiny. Your destiny is not depending on luck. It's depending on what may happen right there at that altar tonight. Amen. I'm glad of that. Now notice, if you will, notice for one minute, goodness and mercy follows you. Oh, listen. I want to tell you, friend of mine, all down to this line, you've turned off radio preachers. I don't like them old preachers. Uh, you've thrown down 
of the Bible that's laying there on the coffee table. I don't have no time for that. Folks have begged you and pled with you. Try to get you to the house of God. They've tried their best to get you under the word of God. Folks come to your house and knock on your door and try to give you a gospel track. And you slam the door in their face. And, and goodness and mercy still there. And still watching over you. And still the little kids look up at you and say, Daddy, go to church with me. Mama, take me to the house of God. And say, get away and leave me alone. And goodness and mercy is still right there. And watching over you. And I'm going to tell you, hot shot, you're getting closer to that gate. Amen. And one day you're going to walk up to it. Oh, somebody said, what's going to happen? What in the name of God is going to happen when I get there? Well, I'm going to tell you something that's going to happen. Number one, my friend, you walk up to that gate. And my dear friend, you step through it. And things change right there. Somebody said, what happened? You look back, and all of a sudden, goodness and mercy is standing back there. You say, come on. Come on. I'm going to need you. They said, no. You're on the other side of the gate now. Amen. They can only go so far. Goodness and mercy follows you all the days of what? Your life. Here. In this world. Amen. Now, but when you step through that gate, goodness and mercy, it's brought you through accidents, you call them. It's brought you through sicknesses, brought you through operations, brought you through near scrapes, brought you through wars, brought you through cancers, brought you through everything that's come your way. And suddenly you look back and they stop. Come on! Come on! No, we're not going. And about that time you look around after you've crossed through the gate of death and you see somebody else coming. You say, What's your name? Who are you? He said, I'm the one you never did want, Daniel. I'm justice. Did you get that? You've run headlong over the mercy of God all through this life. You've jumped up in the altar call and grabbed the songbook or held on the back of the bench. People's pled with you and tried to get you to God. You wiped away hot tears and you've quenched the Holy Spirit and said no to the Holy Ghost. You've done everything in your power to say no to God. But brother, you stepped through that gate. And you can holler and scream for goodness and mercy all you want to. But justice said, I'll take it from right here. I'll take it from right here. Amen. Your days of altar calls is over. Your days of folks bagging on you and pleading and pulling your arm and trying to get you to an altar wet with tears under the preaching of the word of God. And you turned it down and made a mock and laughed at God and said, I didn't get me that time. But honey, you walk off and leave goodness and mercy and walk out of this life and step across through that gate and hear that gate slam behind you. If you'll pardon this crude expression, you've had it. Amen. When you say the Catholic believes that in purgatory, give me chapter and verse. Hmm? They believe in limbo. Give me chapter and verse. Friend, let me tell you something right now. You walk over the gospel in this life. Walk over the blood of Christ and the pleading saints. Step through the gate of death and say goodbye to goodness and mercy. There ain't no purgatory waiting for you. There's a burning hell without God waiting for you. Yeah. We've painted this thing now too, uh, too rosy pink. We've got folks to believe in. Well, it's not as bad as I say it is. But I don't know about you modernists, but I'll tell you what I believe. I believe there's a literal burning, screaming, tormenting hell. Men that die without the Savior go to hell. Men that die without the blood of Christ will wake up in hell. The Bible said where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Do you believe that? Say amen. Modernists don't believe it. They don't believe there's a burning hell. But here's what old long-legged hillbilly preacher that believes there's a hell. 
How many boys and girls go there that turn Jesus down? I believe men and women go there that turn Jesus down. I believe people that's pretended and acting like they've been saved all these years or all these days or all these weeks or whatever time you've been pretending. I believe they go to hell when they die. Amen. I believe every unsaved church member goes to hell. I believe every unsaved preacher goes to hell. I believe every unsaved deacon goes to hell. I believe every unsaved singer goes to hell. Every unsaved teacher goes to hell. Everybody that's never accepted the blood of Jesus, when they die without the blood of Christ, they'll wake up in the pit. I think it's time we begin to believe there's a real hell again. Begin to preach there's a real hell again. Ring a people's doorbells and knock on their doors and plead with them to get right with God. Why in the name of God did we leave those old-fashioned uh, personal work and services at? Mm. I tell you right now, if you're going to ever get them out of this old world saved, you better get them to Jesus. Amen. Amen. You walk through the gate of death and Job said, have they opened to you yet? Have you still got an opportunity, Job said, has that gate open to you? I'll tell you, friend of mine, when you walk out through that gate, your friend, and it closes behind you. Goodness and mercy will not walk through there with you. No, sorry. Goodness and mercy will stand back on the other side. But justice will take over. Justice will say, that's good to you. They tried to get you to God's son. They tried to get you in the blood. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do to you. I'm going to give you exactly what's coming to you. You said, you're talking cold now, preacher. That's the way justice talks. Justice don't know mercy. Justice never been tempered with mercy. Justice just cuts the line like she is. Am I telling the truth, folks? Preachers, am I telling the truth? Justice is not tender. Justice is hard and cold. You say, well, preacher blue... Maybe somebody will plead for me. All the pleading's over. There ain't no more pleading. Maybe some preacher will make another altar call. Just to said the altar calls are over. You said maybe they'll sing a good song. All the singing's over. Just to said we're going to deal with the facts now. Remember when goodness and mercy... Trying to get you to go to the house of God and hear the preaching. You wouldn't do it. He said, you're guilty. You say, well, I meant to. He said, meant to don't count. Well, now, he said, the, remember that time when you went to the hospital and people come in and prayed for you and tried to get you to get right with God. You said, when I get out of here, I'll go to church. And you didn't do it. Well, you're just as bad. I meant to. He said, meant to don't count. You never did go. This may come as a shock to you, but there was a time in my life I wanted to be. I mean this, and I'm, I'm serious about it. I want to be a lawyer. But I think one of the most frightening things I ever saw in my life. A young man had been tried for murder. It was the most clear, concise bit of evidence I'd ever seen presented. I still go watch court cases. To me, I, I, I don't enjoy seeing anybody have to be punished. But I like to see the mechanics of law in action. But I think the most frightening thing I ever saw in my life, all the evidence was in. All of it. The jury had heard all the evidence. Anybody could have saw it was plain. And there was a man, I know we like to think of picturesque ways, but there was a judge on the bench that had listened to all of the evidence Every bit of it. He turned in that swivel chair and charged the jury. Gentlemen of the jury, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when you return from your deliberation, your findings will be found upon fact, not circumstantial evidence. But if your finding dictates to this court that the defendant is guilty, beyond a shadow of a doubt, any reasonable doubt, the court shall find him according to your findings. And then he charged him the other side. If he's innocent, he shall be set free. But the jury went out for a short while and came back in. The bailiff handed the findings on a piece of paper to the judge. 
The judge looked and handed them back to the bailiff to be read. And he asked the defendant to stand and the defendant stood. And he said, Your Honor, the jury finds the defendant guilty as charged with no recommendation of mercy. The judge said, young man, step before the bench. I've never forgot this in all my life. This is when they electrocuted people and they did him. Some of you sorrowful, whining folks that don't believe in capital punishment, God had it in the book before you was born. That young man walked before that judge and the judge said, boy, I've got a son about your age. He said, I find no pleasure in this. But it's clear and concise. It's laid down by law that I, I've sworn to uphold. He said, son, I've charged the jury the jury has brought in the verdict. I sentence you to die in the electric chair of the federal penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. He said to the jury, you're dismissed. Thank you. The courtroom was as silent as a tomb. You say, Preacher Blue, what am I going to get? Hebrews 9, 27. He said, the appointment, and after that, the judgment. Amen. You said, death winds it up. Uh-uh. It don't wind nothing up. It brings you right smack dab in front of justice. Amen. It brings you in front of justice. There's some of you sitting here right now. You walk smack dab over the top of mercy and goodness. They pled with you and tried to get you to God. They pled with you and pled with you. They come to your bedside in many of a night. And the Holy Ghost pled with you and said, Get saved, get saved, get saved. You heard mother praying. You heard loved ones praying. Uh, they visited you, talked to you, and you turned them down. But when you walk up in front of justice, he's going to say, Guilty. No, rep no referees. No higher courts. Nobody's going to intervene for you. Nobody. Nobody's going to take your case. Justice is going to look in the face. Said all them altar calls you turned down. All that pleading you laughed at. All that preaching you didn't like to hear. You turned it down. <laughs> you said no to God. You rejected His Son. You spurred the Holy Ghost. I stretched out my hand and you wouldn't regard it. Justice is going to say, guilty is charged. Take him away. Amen. Am I preaching the truth? Yeah. Yes, I am. You said, oh, preacher, it can't be that cold. It can't be that hard. It can't be that concise. It is. The gate of death closes on mercy and the gate of death opens on justice. Beyond this gate lies heaven or hell, one or the other. It doesn't take a mathematical equation to have to figure that out. You're either saved or you're not saved. You're on the straight and narrow road that leads in or you're on the broad road that leads down. You either have the blood or you don't have. Amen. Next notice, if you will, something else about this gate. It not only closes on mercy and opens on justice, the gate that you'll walk through at the end of your life's journey will close on the pleasures of this life. You know, when I have an opportunity, and my daughter goes to school in Cleveland and I have an opportunity, if I can go over to and sit with her and watch their team play, I go with her make no apology for that. I make no apology for that. None whatsoever. But let me say this. 
Did you know we're in a sports mad, pleasure mad age, amen? When man's, listen, getting back to the radio I was talking about a while ago. We was going home last night. And honestly, you couldn't hear nothing for people screaming on the radio saying, who won that game? Who won that game? Who done that? Who done this? Who shot that one? Who kicked that one? Who broke that one's nose? Amen. Never heard nothing like it in all the days of my life. Never have. But I want to tell you something, friend. When that gate closes, all the pleasure's gone if you're not saved. Amen. All the so-called funny world's gone if you're not saved. I never saw anything like it in my life. Six flags, twelve flags, rodeo, this race, that race, shooting match, turkey shoes, ham shoes. I never seen nothing like it in my life. Even churches and their bingo. My God, the mercy. I want to tell you something, friend. When you step through that gate, you ain't had no time for God, hey? Oh, I just ain't had no... I was in Texas. I was in, in a church. The pastor, the first night, I had a real difficult time. It just seemed like I was choking. You preachers know what I'm talking about. And I went home with the pastor that night after service for some refreshments. And I walked through the door and I found out what was wrong. One whole wall. I was in Dallas, by the way. One whole wall of that man's house had ever, uh, ever a little bitty souvenir, ever flag, ever a helmet with the glasses with a picture of the Dallas Cowboys on it. I never saw nothing like it in all the days of my life. He said, I guess you gather. I'm a football fan. I said, well, I can see that. I, I, I mean, a lot of things take a little while to get through to me. Now you say, what, what, have you got anything at uh, sport? No, no, I haven't. But I'll tell you what he said. He said, if they're playing at the same time we have church, we close church down to go see them. See, we're so cranked up and, and pepped up on on the pills of sports and, and this amusement and that amusement, that bright light and that bright light. But I want to tell you, hot shot, when you step through the gate of death, that's all over. You're laughing and mocking and ridiculing of the church that tried to lift Christ up, the saved or sin bound, a sin sick soul that was headed for hell. That's over. You said the service ain't like last night. No, but God's letting me plow down through somebody's soul. Amen. Boy, there's one. He door sin back a sin sick soul uh, that was headed for hell. That's over. You said the service ain't like last night. No, but God's letting me plow down through somebody's soul. Amen. Boy, there's one thing about it. You're going to come to this gate. And there ain't going to be no running back when God says that's enough. You ain't going to run back and get some old preacher with a hand that's tried to win you to God. Brother, when you walk through that gate, that's final. Justice walks up and said, it's time for you and I to do business. We're going to get together whether you like it or not. We're here now. So my friend, listen. That gate, when it closes on pleasure of this whole world, that gate closes upon all the rose bowls, the cotton bowls, and all the other bowls. It closes upon the, uh, the golf games, ball games, and on the gambling games, and all the other pleasures of this world. It'll all come before God Almighty, and you will face Him. Amen? Amen. But it opens somewhere else. It not only closes upon the pleasures of this world but it opens upon the wages of sin somebody said what you're talking about the bible said when sin is finished it brings what say it loud death when sin is what finished period over done with God said there's death. Death. It closes on pleasure. Now, I, I don't want to be morbid. 
Honest, I don't. But friend, death is not a pretty picture. <laughs> Gasping for breath. Fighting at one's mouth for a little oxygen. You said, Brother Ed, I ain't got no time to think about that. Honey, you better think about that. I'm going to shock you just a little bit, I hope. Did you know there's not a person in this building? I know a hundred years sounds like a long time. But there's not a soul in this building that won't be dead with all real probability in less than a hundred years. When they, what is that song said? I believe it's on your telecast. Where will you be when? A million? Oh, you said that's too much for me to comprehend. Honey, you're going to be somewhere. That song is tremendous. Don't ever quit using it. For every one of you, my friend and myself included, are going to step out of this life and step over in the heaven or hell, one or the other. Think about it. It closes on the pleasures of this life and opens on the wages of sin. What have you earned? What have you got coming to you? What's coming down to the pay envelope? Let me ask this. I wonder how many of you had the nerve I've saw this so many times. Don't tell me I'm prefabricating a story. I've saw it happen. I've saw old mamas on their dying beds reach up and get an old hard-hearted son by the hands and say, Honey, Mama loves you and I've prayed for you. I want you to meet me in heaven, darling. You promised me you'll meet me in heaven. That old boy stand there. Yes, Mama. I'll meet you in heaven. I'll be there. No sooner than the funeral was over, they forgot every promise, Frank. Forgot everything they'd said and walked on in that stubborn, rebellious, arrogant, sarcastic, belligerent manner. Should have lived like I please. Listen, hot shot. You go ahead and live like you please. But when you step through that gate, your arrogance is over. Your broken promises you've thrown around so loosely. Mama's shouting on the other side. God will dry her tears. And she'll never weep over you another day. But while you're burning in the pit of the damned, you'll see Mama shouting on the other. I believe that. Amen. A modernist the other day told me he didn't believe it. That people saw from that. Well, I'll tell you right now in Luke 6, chapter 16, that rich man saw, didn't he? Amen. So it opens on the wages of death. Then notice next of all, if you will, it closes. Get this now. It closes on. Have you ever, have you ever thought after a service, have I made my last altar call? I hardly ever drive away from a church saying, was that the last altar call I'll ever make? And then let me shock you again. I wonder if you'll hear your last altar call tonight. I want us to sing for the invitation. Oh, do not let the word depart. That is, if you have. Oh, why not tonight? It may not be in the books, but if you can find it, we all know it by heart. But I wonder how many has walked away from this revival that's heard their last altar call. No one. It'll close upon that time to repent. There'll be no more God. I'm sorry. God will say your time for repenting is over. No more. Well, you said I meant to repent. I, I planned to do it. Yeah, I'll tell you where you planned to repent at. Let me show you this. You even planned it out that you was going to be in the hospital. You're going to be real old. And they take you to the hospital and then the doctor's going to come in and say, I'm afraid you don't have long. Okay, doc. 
I've had something planned all my life. I'm going to get saved right here. You say, don't you believe in deathbed repentance? I believe there's been some folks saved on their deathbed. But if you're waiting for me to recommend it, honey, you'll never hear it from me. I'll never recommend you to wait till that old deathbed. The book said today is the day and now's the time. If you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. Amen. And there's some of you, my friend, that absolutely shut your fist, so to speak, in the face of God. You said, I'll not get saved till I get ready. But when you get ready, you may not get saved. I'm going to share something with you none of you might not take. I don't believe this old junk that folks can just run up any time and say, Okay, God, I'm ready to mash that magic button. I said last night and I'll still preach it tonight. I believe in Holy Ghost conviction and you'll never get saved. You're convicted of your sin. You'll never do it. And I'm going to share something with you again. I preached this in the college one time and I thought they were going to crucify me before I got off of the campus. I still believe a man, my friend, can sin a sin unto death. I still believe there's a line you can cross. There's no place of return. I still believe that. Said I don't believe it. I can't help what you believe. You ain't preaching, I ain't. And I believe with all of my heart, when that gate closes behind you, your damn altar calls, and getting saved is over. There ain't no more place to get saved after you die. You know who I'm you know who I'm really sorry for tonight. All week long, it seemed like I've been seeing young faces right in front of me. All week long, I've seemed like God just had a multitude of young faces right in front of me. There's some of you boys and girls think that you've got time to sow your wild oats and live wild and live the life you want to. But I'm going to tell you why you still got a tender heart that God can deal with. You better not harden that heart. You better let God deal with you. There's me, and I dealt with a man some time ago up in his 70s. I he said, I used to believe the Bible, but I don't believe it no more. I used to believe in God, but I don't believe it anymore. No Let me tell you something, friend of mine. He that being off time reproved. I used to misquote this and hardeneth his heart. Don't say it that way. He that being off time reproved hardeneth his heart. You show me a man that's been preached to all his life and walked over the gospel and walked through the power of God and walked through the grace of God, he'll be as hard as a rock. Amen? And God will let you get that way. I believe this week revival, God's giving some of you young folks a chance. There's one girl from about right there last night. You know what she asked for? She asked for God to give a revival in her, in her school. Some of you are even afraid to identify yourself. Some of you used to take your Bible to school, but you're afraid you'll be called a fanatic, aren't you? I'm going to tell you why you walk for God, you better do it. Some of you young folks sitting around here right now while God's, while you're on the other side of that gate and living and got warm blood flowing through your veins and a pulse beating and saints around you praying for you that you can be strong in the Lord, you better live for God. I know you're looking at me funny. Some of you said I can't be a fanatic. One boy told me that's the reason he couldn't get a haircut. I'd be ashamed of that. You look like, listen, you look like what you're hanging around. Amen? You said don't look like a hippie. You just want to kind of look like one, don't you? You don't want to look all the way like one. You just kind of want to fuzz around and kind of look like one of them. Amen? You're a this is Brother Blue. I hope and pray this tape has been a blessing to whoever may be listening. Uh, there was just a few more minutes of the uh, message, but uh, you have got the full weight of it in the text. But we were not able to get it all on the original uh, trans uh, when we uh, recorded the last time. So uh, I trust this tape has been a blessing to you and to whoever may listen. God bless you as our prayer. Remember us when you pray. Second Thessalonians 3, 1 and 2. When you walk through the gate of death, that's final as far as getting right with God's concerned. There ain't no more getting right with God.
There ain't no more altar call. There ain't no more banches to bow around and your loved ones to get around you and pray for you. That's over. Some of you mothers and daddies sitting here right now. Living a loose life. Somebody don't know about all your affairs you're having. You ain't been caught up with yet, hey? You shiver and shake and afraid you will be. But I'm going to tell you, when you step through that gate, God said it's going to be shouting from the house. It's going to be revealed. Well, I feel a stranger sweeping over the surface. I feel a stranger. A strangeness moving over there. You said, Preacher Blue, I'm a hardening my heart. Go ahead, friend of mine. But when you walk through that gate I've been talking about, God will take care of you anyhow. 